One of the most interesting parts of One Piece is wanting to know the origins of Luffy and his father, Monkey D. Dragon. We are sure this will be explained one day, but then we guarantee they will bring out more questions like for example, Luffy's mother. We picked apart chapter 1023 and even though there is so much to go over, we discovered some great things and come up with probably our most mind-blowing theory to date. This theory will connect Luffy, Dragon, Luffy's mother and even King's race. Rather given an introduction to the video, let's cut to the chase and present to you this theory. Everyone, Flying Panda, the One Piece Fears. Luffy's Origin Explained The Forgotten King's Race in One Piece by Legendary Anime. So it's been revealed of King's races and already everyone is putting two and two together that is part of the three races that descended from the moon in the NL cover space arc. Anime watchers only won't know about this so I highly recommend you at least pull these images up and see them for yourself. We'll explain a bit here. NL after being defeated by Luffy ascends to the moon in his search for the endless earth which is his dream. After he saves the Automator, which are a race of small robot men created by the three races who lived on the moon, and there was then shown ancient paintings by the Automator of the history of these ancient races. In these paintings, we see the three races. The most obvious of the three is the Skypeans. As we can see, they are funny antennas that stick out of their heads. Next are the Shandorians. This is clear because of their Aztec look and how they look like a primitive race. More on them later. And lastly, is what we now assume, or in fact know, to be the race of the Lunarians. Of all three of the winged races, only they have different shaped wings compared to the other two. And King's wings match the same style as Oda drew back in that cover page. So we can almost confirm, and I'd say it's 99% assured, that the third race is Lunarian. So as we have it, the Skypeans descended from the moon to the heavens where they became known as the Angels. Next is the Shandorians who descended to the lower world and became basically the One Piece version of the Aztec people. And lastly, the Lunarians who descended to the top of the Red Line. But what are they? I find it interesting all the knowledge we've gained from chapter 1023. It's just amazing and is helping with our conclusion. Now Queen and Marco mention that the Lunarians can burst into flames but don't burn like normal people would. Their bodies have a natural immunity to fire which in my opinion can only mean they are dragon people. Human dragons or dragon humanoids have been a part of fantasy culture for some time now. Generally when a dragon transforms into a human is to blend in with the human races. We're not saying King or his people are fallen dragons, but rather they are humanoids with dragon properties, hence the fire, resistance to fire, and their wings. After all, Skypeans have wings too, which is what makes them angels. The Shandorians, on the other hand, are a different case, but again, we'll get more into that later on. Wait bro, I found something, look at this. Is an old sketch design Oda did for King. Bloody hell, so we're right. Best One Piece theorists confirmed. <laughs> On a serious note, at the time of making this, we found this drawing at the last minute, and as we all know, Oda does tend to make changes to his character designs, but he keeps them close to how the original was done. So in this case, King looks very much like a dragon. Well, his head does anyway. Now, as for his current design, Clearly Oda is hiding something and it's starting to seem very likely it will have dragon features even if it's just scales or dragon-like teeth. Something to also note 
is that Wano was the location for Oda's first series, Monsters, which we should all know by now, of course, but after the reveal that Zoro is a descendant of Ryuma, it's making even more sense. After all, what did Ryuma become famous for? He killed a dragon. Zoro did too, back on Punkazid, and he even cut Kaido. And if King is a dragon man, then it's making even more and more sense, because Zoro will defeat a dragon, or a dragon man. Now we've established that the Lunarians are of a dragon type humanoid, why were they living on top of the red line? Now it's been hinted that they lived there long before Mary Joas was even built and that there might even still be some living there. Perhaps it was just the ideal location for them, where they felt more at home. However, what if there is an even greater reason for this? In most western culture tales of dragons, they are said to be guarding treasure as dragons sleep on a bed of gold and riches. What if it was the Lunarians who first built Mary Juas for the purpose of building a place to guard their most precious of treasures? It would only make sense, right, that dragons or dragon people would guard treasure. But it's not so much their treasure as we believe there might be more than what meets the eye. Since the reveal of the giant straw hat, everyone's assuming that the straw hat must be the national treasure. However, that hat is only one of several. Eam only goes into one of the seven chambers. This opens up the possibility that there are seven national treasures, and of them seven, we've only seen one. In the story, there are several races in the world. Those races are humans, fishmen, giants, minks, Skypeans, Shandorians, and lastly, the Lunarians. That makes seven races in total. We don't count the tribes of Longarm or Longleg, as they're still human, much like the larger humans of the story too. They're human, just a bit different. Granted, Chandorians could also be looked to as humans also, but if they're descended from the moon, then they're technically not human. It's our belief that before the time of the Void Century, these races all lived together and cultivated an alliance. In other words, this was the true world government where no one race ruled over another, but they were meant to live in bands. However, due to the war that broke out and the events of the Void Century, Eam took the world government and made it into what we know now. Big Mum states that King might very well be the last of his race. So the question is, what happened to the rest? This is where things get a little dark. So one thing we know about the Celestial Dragons is that they consider themselves to be gods and as such they have little to no value for the lives of other races as they keep them as slaves. But why do they have this god complex to them? They are just regular humans after all, right? Well, what if we told you that they are indeed just normal humans but in the most twisted of ways try to become more than human? Consider their title Celestial Dragons. Celestial means from the sky or space. Now that we know that the Lunarians are from space and that they are dragon people, doesn't Celestial Dragon sound like it should be the Lunarian's title? For the human Celestial Dragons to employ this title and have a god complex, there's only one thing that comes to mind. Sacrificial ritual, in other words, they cannibalize them. Exocannibalism, from Greek exo from outside, and cannibalism, to eat humans, as opposed to endocannibalism, is the consumption of flesh outside one's close search group, for example, eating one's enemy. When done ritually, it has been associated with being a means of imbibing value qualities of the victim or as an act of final violence against the deceased in the case of sociopath, as well as symbolic expression of the domination of an enemy in warfare. Such practices have been documented in cultures including the Aztecs from Mexico, the Carib, and the Tupinaba from South America. This is one of the dark secrets of the Void Century and the reason the Celestial Dragons have become what they are. This isn't made a genetic change with them like it has with, say, Sanji, if the DNA of the Lunarians was fused within him. In the Celestial Dragons case, it's all in their minds, meaning they become twisted and mental from cannibalism and likely practice this ritual for hundreds of years, possibly as a rite of passage. 
but whatever the case, it made the mentally unstable. However, there is one exception that is with the flamingo. Now Doofy was especially insane, even by a Celestial Dragon standpoint. From a young age, he employed the role of a Celestial Dragon despite his parents, who seemed to be more stable minded than the other Celestial Dragons. Doofy even as a child unlocked Konkurizaki. This meant he was destined for great things, which only twisted his mind that much more. Now the reason we said he is the exception to the other Celestial Dragons is cause he may have gained some genetic traits from the Lunario sacrifices. Remember his death fruit was string string death fruit? And out of all techniques he used only one had me scratching my head with wonder how he did it. The technique overheat. This attack was a form of string that he produced from the palm of his hands but the string was red hot, almost as if it was condensed fire within the string itself. Now we know the science behind this, it can be explained by friction, however, we are right that celestial dragons have been consuming the Lunarians for centuries through sacrificial rituals then Dofi might be the first to have inherited the power of fire from this ritual. Something else I noticed too was that when Dofi was facing off against Sanji, Sanji hit Dofi with a barrage of his Diambo Jamba, and Dofi blocked with his feathered coat. Something to note here is that when he was blocking, he didn't even use Haki to block, and even though we know Sanji wasn't as strong as Dofi at the time, you would think those feathers would at least have got burnt, right? The wiki states that these feathers are just coat of fashion, accessories that Doofy wears, but so too did his brother Corazon, only his were black. What I'm wondering is, could of those feathers have been wings, or rather a form of wing, like they had to grow wings but they had misshaped and somewhat mismutated. Against this could be the effects of ritual and when you consider that Sanji's attacks didn't even burn the feathers, it starts to seem possible. Give us your thoughts on this topic in the comments, are we crazy? Do you agree? Do these connections make some sense? Anyways, let's move on. After the reveals of chapter 1023, we've been looking more into what some of these connections could mean for other characters. Like the fact that Queen hints that Sanji could have been altered by a judge with the DNA of the Lunarians. This then starts to make us wonder about Luffy and his Red Hulk attack. For years now, we've suggested that it's mainly to do with friction, that his rubber body, when stretched and combined with armament lucky, makes his arm burst into flames through friction. And this could still be true, but we can't overlook these new reveals, and after piecing some things together, we might finally know the true origins of Luffy and what makes him the true thing. Now everyone knows or assumes that Luffy is the sun god depicted in the legends. And of course, this makes sense, as the minks keep talking about the coming of a new dawn. And as we suspect, Luffy will be the one to bring about the new dawn. Do you remember our old theory about Monkey D. Dragon having the Thunderbird that we threw, and that he is descended from the Shandorian race? Well, in that theory, we suggest that Dragon is half Shandorian, and that is on his mother's side, which, if this is the case, would make him a descendant of the moon races. Just a quick side note, have you ever wondered why Garp used to wear that dog hat, headgear? Remember back to Skypea and the elder of the Shandorian tribe? He too wore something very similar, just a bit more tribal in his design. The reason we believe Garp wore this hat was out of respect for his former wife, and quite possibly it was a kind of wedding gift after Garp had married into the tribe, sort of like a ceremonial piece. And speaking of headgear, this is how we know the Shandorians are descended from one of the moon races. If you go back to chapter 472 and see the cover page of the three races who left the moon, notice that the one in the middle is wearing a headpiece too. Would you believe it? But we only found the same headpiece in ancient Aztec paintings. Clearly this is what Oda used as the basis for the idea of the moon people and it's quite interesting. First off, notice that the style of both paintings are the exact same. This means that Oda's main premise for the moon and its people is to be set after the Aztec thing. The god in the painting is Toluk. Toluk is a member of the Patreon gods in Mexican religion. As supreme god of the rain, Toluk is also a god of earthly fertility and of water. He was widely worshipped as a benevolent giver of life and sustenance. However, he was also feared 
for his ability to send hell, thunder and lightning and for being the lord of the powerful element of water. The Aztec people were known as sun worshippers. They worshipped the sun and their creation of the world myths have quite the interesting take on it. The five suns, in the context of creation myths, the term five describes the doctrine of the Aztecs and our Noir people, in which the present world preceded by four other circles of creation and destruction. It is primarily deprived of the mythological, cosmological and eschatological beliefs and traditions of earlier cultures from Central Mexico and the Mesoamerican Americans region in general. The late post-classic Aztec society inherited many traditional concerning Mesoamerica creation accounts while modifying some of the aspects and supplying novel interpretations of their own. In the creation myths, which were known to the Aztecs and other Noir people of the late post-classical era, the central tenet was that there had been four worlds of suns before the present universe. These earlier worlds and their inhabitants had been created and destroyed by the catastrophic actions of leading deity figures. The present world is the fifth sun and the Aztecs saw themselves as the people of the sun whose divine duty was to wage cosmic war in order to provide the sun with his nourishment. Without it, the sun would disappear from the heavens, thus the welfare and the other survival of the universe depended upon the offering of blood and hearts to the sun. This was great importance to one piece story cause if Luffy is the sun god, then what is Imu? If we were to take into account the myths from the Aztecs, then perhaps Imu is one of the sun gods from this myth, and after he is taken down, then a new sun or new dawn will rise, Luffy. We can even connect Imu to the myths of the five suns through the Gorosei, the five elder stars. Let's see how the myth plays out. From the void that was the rest of the universe, the first god, Omeotio, created itself. Omeotio was both male and female, good and evil. Light and darkness, fire and water, judgment and forgiveness, the god of duality. Omotio gave birth to four children, the four Tezcatlipocas, who each present over one of the four cardinal directions. From the west presides the white Tecastilopa, the god of light, mercy and wind. Over the south besides the blue Tezcatlipopa, the god of war. Over the east presides the red Tezcatlipopa, the god of gold farming in springtime, and over the north presides the black Tezcali Lopa, also called simply Tezki Lipoka, the god of judgment, night, deceit, sorcery, and the earth. First sun, it was four gods who eventually created all the other gods and the world we know today, but before they could create, they had to destroy, for every time they, they attempted to create something, it would fall into the water beneath them and be eaten by Sipakli, the giant earth crocodile who swam through the waters with mouth at every one of the, her joints. The four Teski Lipokas descended the first people who were giants. They created the other gods, the most important of whom were the water gods Talak, the god of rain, fertility, and Chachurti Ku, the god of lakes. Rivers and oceans also the goddess of beauty to give light. They needed a god to become the sun and a black Tezcali Poka was chosen, but either because he had lost a leg or because he was god of the night. He only became half a sun. The world continued on this way for some time, but a sibling rivalry grew between Quetzalcoatli and his brothers, the mighty sun, who Quetzalcoatli knocked from the sky with a stone club. With no sun, the world was totally black and his anger, Tezcatlipoca, commanded his jaguars to eat all the people. Second Sun The gods created a new group of people to inhabit the earth, this time they were of normal size. Quetzalcoatl became the new sun and as the years passed, the people of the earth grew less and less civilized and stopped showing proper honor to the gods. As a result, Tezcatlipoca Demonstrate his power and authority as god of sorcery and judgment by turning the animalistic people into monkeys. Corset Colet, who had loved the flawed people as they were, became upset and blew all of the monkeys from the face of the earth with a mighty hurricane. He then stepped down in the sun to create new people. The third sun. Tarlok became the next sun, 
but Tusky Lee Lopa seduced and stole his wife, Kotiquazo, the goddess of sex, flower, and corn. Talak then refused to do anything other than willow in his own grief, so a great drought swept the world. The people's prayers for rain annoyed the grieving son and he refused to allow it to rain, but the people continued to beg him. Then in the field of range, he answered their prayers with a great downfall of fire. It continued to rain fire until the entire earth had burned away. The gods then had to construct a whole new earth from the ashes. Fourth son, the next son and also Talak's new wife, was Chachulatoku. She was loving towards the people, Tuskali Poka was not. Both the people and Chicholiku felt his judgment when he told the water goddess that she was not true love and only fake kindness of selfishness to gain the people's praise. Chachuliku was so crushed by the words that she cried blood for the next 52 years, causing a horrific flood that drowned everyone on the earth. Humans became fish in order to survive. Fifth son, Quetzal Kole, would not accept the destruction of his people and went to the underworld where he stole their bones from the god Meta Tichali. He pipped those bones in his own blood to resurrect his people who reopened their eyes to the sky illuminated by the current sun, Quetzilopochile. The Itzimime of stars became jealous of this brighter more important brother, Quetzilopochitli, their leader, Koyolaxli, god of the moon, led them in an assault on the sun and every night they come close to victory when they shine throughout the sky. They are beaten back by the mighty Quetzilopochitli, who ruled the daytime sky. To aid this all, Impon god in its continuation war, the Aztecs offered him the nourishment of human sacrifices to Tezcali Poka in fear of his judgment, offering their own blood to Quetzalcoatlay, who opposed fatal sacrifices in thanks of his blood sacrifices for them and gave offerings to many other gods for many purposes. Should those sacrifices cease or should mankind fail to please the gods for an inner reason, this fifth sign would go black. The world will be shattered by the catastrophic earthquake. Zitzi Meitu will slay Hoizopoleti and all of humanity. The first thing we must take a look at from this is in order for the sun to keep shining and giving life to the world, sacrifices must be made to it. We talked about the celestial dragons making sacrificial sacrifices in the form of them gaining the strength of the Lunarians. But then if him is the sun god currently, who is sacrificed to him? It's been a big wonder why Eam has that picture of Evie, and we've even speculated that Eam wants Evie for some kind of ritual. Could it be that she is the next sacrifice? Take note of the last part of the myth, as it states that the sun shall turn black and the earth will quake. This sounds so much like Blackbeard. He has the power of darkness, and even the power to make earthquakes. Could his end goal be to plunge the world in darkness and destroy it? Remember Blackbeard's childhood drawing he sits upon the edge of a cliff, huddled together and looking very dirty and beat up. He looks up at the moon with a look of sadness and hatred. Could Blackbeard also be descended from the moon? And if so, does he bear some sort of hate towards this fact? Something to bear in mind here is that the myths of the five sons is told in several different ways. This is due to these myths being passed down through the ages by word of mouth. This creates the Chinese whisper effect, and as such, there is a part of this myth that we need to explore. Creating the fifth sun. At the end of the fourth sun, the gods gathered at Teotihuacan to decide who had to sacrifice him or herself for the new world to begin. The god Huatelk, the old fire god, started a sacrificial bonfire, but none of the most important gods wanted to jump into the flames. The rich and proud god Teki Sizi Kadal, the Lord of Snails, hesitated, and during that hesitation, the humble and poor Nana Wazim, meaning full of sores, leapt into the flames and became the new sun. Teki Sizi Kadal jumped in after him to become a second sun. However, the gods realized that two suns would overwhelm the world, so they threw a rabbit at Teki Sizi Kadal, and he became the moon. That is why you can still see the rabbit in the moon today. The two celestial bodies were set in motion by Iketu, god of wind, who fiercely and violently blew the sun into motion. Now, Nana Wazim, in all accounts, 
of the legend is said to have been a very ill and diseased god, which in some regards reminds us of Goldie Roger. After all, he was ill towards the end of his journey and had an incurable disease. But let's not forget something else here, because let's also remember that Roger is now gone. So even if he was destined to become the Sun God, he or rather Rayleigh states that they were too soon. Even Roger's son Ace ended up having the Mia Mia no Me, which is a fire devil fruit, and in his battle against Blackbeard, he used an attack named after the sun. Perhaps Ace was meant to be the next Sun God, but now he's gone. And as we know, Luffy is likely the one now destined to become the Sun God. So does that make him Nana Wazim? If your question is based on the fact that Luffy isn't like Roger, that he doesn't have an incurable disease, well, that's wrong. Luffy does indeed have something very similar to this. We've mentioned it here many times, and it's not changed. Luffy is dying, it's quite often overlooked and even forgotten about. After all, Luffy seems to be in the best shape of his life, right? Wrong. Luffy is killing himself, slowly but surely, and no matter how you try to cut it, he's lost so much of his lifespan that he'll be lucky to live into his 30s. With each battle, he takes more damage than a normal person would take, and this is made so clear when Kuma made Zoro take all of Luffy's pain. Even Zoro can take some serious pain, but even just a small taste of Luffy's shocked him to his core. And that was just after fighting Moria and Oz. Imagine how he's going to be feeling after fighting Kaido. Luffy's disease, if we're going to call it that, is the disease of age. He's lost and endured so much in the last few years that he's going to die before his dream. This becoming the Sun God is but only a metaphor for becoming the Pirate King. Luffy, like Nana Wazim, will jump into the fire and become the Sun God, the Pirate King. Something else to notice here is that Blackbeard is Tezi Siki Cattle. This is made clear with how Tezi Siki Cattle acted before the bonfire. He showed fear and was even scared, just like how it's been questioned if Blackbeard is even a true thief, as he doesn't smile in the face of death like all the other D do. Lastly, on this, the Monkey D Dragon is Efecto, the God of the Wind. This should be fairly obvious, so we won't explain it. But while we're talking about Dragon, let's re-explore his origins. If he is truly of the Shandian people, then that makes Luffy descended from them too. However, one of the biggest unanswered questions to date is, who is Luffy's mother? Now we can't give a name or even a deception of who she might be, it's too much of a mystery, and frankly there are just too many ways to answer this. However, what if we know of her origin? Let's go back to King for a moment, the Lunarians. These people are one of the three moon races that have the ability to produce fire at will. Coming back to Luffy's Red Hulk, or even yes, you guessed it by now, what if his mother is a Lunarian? If we are correct that Dragon is descendant from the Shandian race tribe, and Luffy's mother is a Lunarian or a descendant of the Lunarians like Dragon and his half, then that means Luffy is descended from both which makes him one quarter Shandian, one quarter Lunarian and half human and that makes of three races, the theme of three. At this point you might even ask, then why doesn't Luffy have wings? Hell, why doesn't Dragon have wings? Well. Luffy likely didn't inherit these wings, and this is due to the human side of his DNA being the more dominant side of his genetic makeup. But one thing we notice and we found curious is that Oda draws Luffy with wings on a cover of one of the Skypen issues. Of course, this is just an art, but was that Oda foreshadowing this all along? Was Luffy meant to have wings, or would grow them later? And if so, could it be one white and one black to represent the combustion of both races? But in Dragon's case, well, we ever seen him without the cloak on? Could it be that his cloak is hiding his wings or maybe, maybe he too never inherited the wings and inherited his father's genes? The human garbs more than he did of his mother's. Further proof of his alliance or possible relationship between the Shandians and the Lanarians is foreshadowed in the page cover of chapter 470. In this page, the Shandians and the Lunarians are working on building the automators and seem to be discussing something while the Skypeans left outside. Notice in the page that the Skypean is leading the three automators, but there is actually four, including the one being built. We draw your attention to them because in the cover pages leading up to and around in our space journey, there are four of the automators and if you look at the cover page with Luffy with wings, we see the four priests of Anel. 
and if you look closely in each of the four automators, they each resemble the four priests. In some way, take note too that the priests aren't Skypeans, which is shown by the fact that they don't have the antennas that the Skypeans do, but they have the wings, meaning they're descendant from one or both of the other two races. Now back to the Lunarians. Think about it. If they were indeed dragon people, and Lupi's father's name is Dragon, then put two and two together and you get... Consider this for a moment, if you will. The D in the D family is also a mystery, but what do you get if you combine two Ds that descend from the most ancient of the races? We're suggesting that the three moon races might have been the original Ds, and after mixing with the other races of the world, they branched off and became the Ds that we know now. Bear in mind that they even a family of giants descended from the deep fan. And don't ask me how a giant and one of the moon races mated. Use your imagination if you must. Coming back to combining the two ancient Ds. It takes me back to an old theory that I remember seeing. That when the sun is eclipsed by the moon, it creates a half sun. Which is the meaning of the D as the theory goes. But in my opinion, that theory is only half baked. Meaning that we're only seeing half of the picture here. If the sun is only half, then what is the other half? Of course it's the moon, but we have not only one piece here, but the D has two meanings to it. The first is dawn, which implies to the D members a smile when they are about to die or facing death. Without even knowing it, they know the new dawn will come. Dawn can also mean the birth of a civilization, the dawn of a new age. And the second is dusk. These are the ones who fear death as dusk is when the sun sets and night becomes dark. Currently only Blackbeard is of the dusk. This could also be part of why he never sleeps. Generally by dusk people would start to feel tired after a long day after waking up at the crack of dawn, but in Blackbeard's case his body can't set meaning that if he's aware of the different D meanings, he's willingly forcing himself to try and become a dawn. But in doing so, he's become twilight. Twilight is the last rays of light from the sun being the day, break or sunset. Its meaning is a state of obscurity, ambiguity or gradual decline. This means that Blackbeard is stuck between the D's meaning and as a result is in a state of twilight which means he can't sleep because he's suspended between day and night. This has resulted in his madness and quite possibly his final dream is to end the cycle of the world, not meaning to wish to destroy the world but to stop the flow and suspend the world in eternal twilight. So either he can sleep finally or stop everyone else from sleeping so he is not the only one suffering anymore. The true meaning of the D is D plus D equals O. The O or zero is the whole meaning that the Ds make it a whole. The O is the one and the one piece is the two, making the one, meaning this is the one piece. It's been stated many times that the one piece isn't the treasure, as in a treasure of gold and riches, and it's not some lame meaning like it's the journey you endured to get there, but rather it's referring to the one who conquered all, united it all, and stands above all. Conquering the Grand Line is only part of it, but it is the key element in finding the one piece and becoming the Pirate King. After all, only Roger managed this, and that's because it's part of fate, destiny, and a dream. The O is the world, the moon, the sun, and even the Grand Line. Each are round like an O, and the one who rules them all is the one who lives free. Hence Luffy is the One Piece, and by the end of the story, he will have reached the same enlightenment that Roger reached and passed on the cycle of life that only the true One Piece can reach. Let me clarify this, One Piece does exist but also it doesn't. Whitebeard confirmed that it does exist but that's only because he knows what it is. Remember that Whitebeard intended to make Ace the new pirate king like Ace's father before him, Goldie Roger. And in Whitebeard's mind, he probably believed that it was only Ace who could become the pirate king because he shared Roger's blood. But before his death, Whitebeard, he saw Ace dies which ends the dream of seeing of making Ace the new Pirate King, but it was likely at that moment that he realised that becoming the Pirate King had nothing to do with blood, that the One Piece can be found by those who are destined or dreamt of it. It was in the arc that Whitebeard met Luffy and of course Luffy likes also proclaims he will become 
picked up the king of the pirates. Whitebeard didn't laugh, nor did he suggest that it's not possible, which in most cases those are the people's reaction to Luffy's claim. No, instead Whitebeard showed his overwhelming presence and forced to test Luffy's resolve and as Luffy didn't back down, he earned Whitebeard's respect. But as the course of the battle took toll and Ace was about to be executed, Luffy used Conqueror's Haki for the first time which shocked everyone, even Whitebeard. That's interesting is that it was at this point that Whitebeard decided to aid Luffy and ordered his men to aid and protect Luffy too. While Whitebeard saw something in Luffy's Haki, meaning that he felt Roger's present. And no, not that Luffy is Roger or Roger's reborn, we meant that Whitebeard felt the presence of the same level of Conqueror's Haki or close to that of Roger's. This is what becoming one of the deciding factors for Whitebeard that upon his death, he knew the one Roger was waiting for would be Luffy. Roger told Whitebeard the meaning of D, which means Whitebeard knew what he was looking for when he makes a D. This is how he knew and proclaims to Teach that he, Teach, is not the one. Whitebeard could see that Teach was not a true D because he is suspended in twilight. The One Piece does exist, but at the same time it doesn't exist. The meaning to this is that there is a material item why it's a treasure, but the item is only half of it. Like two Ds forming the O, so true is the same principle for the One Piece. The material object must be claimed by the missing half, which is the person who transcends the D and becomes the O. D means dusk and dawn. Once a D reaches the balance between both meanings of D, they become an O or Omega. Omega is the Greek alphabet letter for O and it means end. This suggests that Luffy will be the end. Once he becomes the Omega, he will end the world as we know it. But by destroying the old world, he will bring about the beginning of the new world, the new dawn. A world where freedom is real and all races live in harmony. This brings true world peace, hence the One Piece. One world, peace, peace. Anyway, thanks for watching the video. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I hope uh, everyone either it agrees, but if you disagree, it's fine. It is what it is. We've all got our own opinion. It's just a theory at the end of the day. It's what we're doing, you know. We've been doing this for many years now, me and Panda. And uh, yeah, until uh, I suppose until the end, we'll keep doing what we do. Anyway, this has been Legendary Anime. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I hope you have a good time. Please do comments down below, please click like and if you haven't, please subscribe to Flying Panda and of course, join our Discord. As you know, we got a Twitter account, meet us there, we got Facebook, join us there, and also we got a Discord channel with over 2000 members. We're a great admin team, great members. We always talk about our One Piece theories in this channel. We always talk about One Piece in general. We talk about films. We talk about games. So if you haven't already, see you there on the Discord channel. One thing, I don't know why. It doesn't even matter how hard you try. Keep that in mind, I designed this rhyme. Stay in due time, or I know. Time is a valuable thing. What you fly by as a pendulum swings. What you count down to the end of the day. To clock like a wave, it's so unreal. Do you look out below? What time fly through out the window? Trying to hold on, but didn't even know. I wasted it all just to watch you go. I kept everything inside, even though I tried. It all fell apart. What it meant to be will eventually be a memory of a time when I tried so hard. Ha ha ha!